the attendee list is going up. Meanwhile, I'll uh, start with the introductions. Hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Wise uh, webinar this month. I am Akanksha Singh. I'm the community builder at uh, Be Waste Wise. And as you all know that we have been organizing such uh, waste dialogues on monthly basis, addressing the need for knowledge dissemination on waste management since uh, 2013. We are a non-profit organization. We have been uh, bridging this waste solutions expertise gap worldwide for over a decade now. As you all know that Be Waste Wise is a platform which is clear in its principle. Diversity is different from same people talking about the same thing to the same people and expecting change. And uh, diversity means actively seeking new groups of people and ways of knowing and thinking to keep learning about the world. If we agree on everything, then there is no diversity and no need for dialogue. We uh, believe in our principle and basis this, uh, we are holding this topic of discussion on this webinar. If you see the value in making diverse sustainability dialogues such as these available uh, free of charge to anyone and everyone, then support us in our mission. Uh, every donation helps us create, curate and produce such uh, waste dialogues on diverse topics. We encourage you all to do check out our uh, website and donate. Uh, we'll be sharing the donation page link uh, over the chat as well. Now, moving on for today's uh, webinar uh, discussion topic, uh, we will be evaluating a very debatable topic in the industry that is on waste incineration. The panelists on this webinar will discuss the different issues that incineration presents to our environment, economy, and society. Additionally, they will also discuss additional strategies and priorities that should be uh, that should guide waste management decision makers in order to move closer to a circular economy in both the global south and the global north. To moderate this webinar, we have with us today uh, Piotrek, uh, who's the newest moderator on Blue on uh, Be Waste Wise platform. Uh, Piotr is, uh, Patrick is the Belgian Polish national with over uh, 13 years of experience in circular economy policy development. He is a council member of the European Environment Bureau and a board member of the Polish Zero Waste Association. He is uh, very much involved in the development of the circular economy in Africa. Previously, he worked at the Polish Ministry of the Environment and Polish Humanitarian Action. With him, we have on the panel today uh, Yannick Wack from the Zero Waste Europe, uh, Marel uh, Vilela from uh, Global Alliance for Incinator Alternatives, and uh, soon, uh, Shalini Goyal uh, Bhalla will be joining from International Council for Circular Economy. Uh, before we proceed uh, further to this exciting discussion, I would like to make a few announcements. This uh, webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our website and YouTube channel. You will not be getting any certificates for this. Uh, We've been getting a lot of queries uh, regarding the certificates, but uh, you will not be getting any certificates for this. Uh, please use the Q&A function for your, your questions to the panel. And uh, your uh, comments and your uh, views, your suggestions, uh, all that in the, com in the comments sec section. Uh, we will be uh, sharing our panelists' uh, LinkedIn profile in this function for whoever wants to connect with them personally. I request all the panelists to please share your LinkedIn profiles over the chat as well. Now, back to the panel today. Uh, over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Akankska. Um, and welcome, everyone. Thank you. I'm, uh, thank you for organizing this to Be Waste Wise. And I'm very happy this day has come. I've been, uh, you know, um, on this topic and I've been working on the on circular economy and waste solutions for many many years even people before me do also remember this very div divisive issue of the role of uh, waste burning or waste incineration in waste management and then later in circular economy so let's maybe take stock of what is actually the the challenge and what is the solution and um we want to hear very much from you we have a very large group of attendees now and I'm Quite, quite stressed now, honestly, even if I don't do this for the first time. But, but we also have here very um, knowledgeable speakers that, we, that I have uh, met on different occasions. For example, in Paris at the COP, COP uh, in Paris in 2015, in Brussels at policy making, but also at global level, we'll have some colleagues speaking from their experience from African countries, from, uh, from Asia and others from Europe. Myself, um, I represent today the Polish Zero Association, where we also have a lot of questions, discussions at different levels on waste incineration. So we want to see whether 
we'll probably not find the solution or we will not uh, agree on everything, but we want to hear from you here in the chat or in the questions as well. As we go, please put your uh, questions. The shorter, the better, because if they are long, you know that it's quite difficult to go through them. Um, and we will address them. Um, I, I um, invited the colleagues here because they cover very well the different, maybe most current, um, most pressing issues. One is the issue of climate. You know, what is really the the role, or what um, what that what is the impact of waste incineration on our climate? Secondly, the pollution. Um, but also, we will look at different solutions. Um, this is very important. We will speak a lot about solutions, and I would like to hear from you in the chat as well, colleagues from from around the globe on what other solutions would you suggest at different scale and different level uh, to uh, to maybe go one step further than only waste incineration, which is the one of the lowest, uh, as you know, echelons of the waste hierarchy. So yeah, let me go forward. Um, I will uh, invite Mariel, that is the um, climate program, um, director for global climate program at Gaia. Um, attending uh, climate uh, talks, uh, but also looking at finances of for climate. Uh, and from your experience, your organization has been uh, working um, to address the incineration issue for many decades and in many countries. So I would like to invite you, Marielle, I think you will share this, a few slides from your end, okay, um, to tell us your story um, around the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Piot. Thank you so much uh, for the organizing of this webinar to be waste wise and hello to everyone. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I'm Mariel Vilella. I'm the director of the Global Climate Program in Gaia. And today we're going to talk about this very important topic, waste to energy incineration. And I will particularly look at the context on global climate finance, which is our field of expertise where I work. And Mireia, Mireia, Mariel, Mariel, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot just one thing. Uh, yes. Can I, can I, we have a pool actually, to start everything, maybe to oh. tune everyone. Sorry. Uh, yes, we have a pool. If Akanshka, I can ask you to just pull up the, the pool and then we will go to the questions because I don't want to, you know, uh, sure. Sure. influence no the, influence uh, the uh, replies Mar already. Okay? Mariel, can yeah. you, Mariel, can you put down your slides? Can yes, you no worries. Thank you so much. I'm launching the polls, yes. So you, you can see the pool. Um, the question is simple. Mm. Do you think that waste incineration have a role to play in the low emission inclusive circular economy in the long term? The questions, the answers are very straightforward. Let's uh, have one minute or two. Okay. Wow, that is very equal score. Colleagues, um, we will have quite some, quite some uh, pros and cons to discuss here. Fine, Akanshka, I think we can, uh, I don't know how many percentage now I've replied, but I think it's quite, yeah, 80% is fine. Okay, so most of people uh, over, yeah, 38%, yes, there is a role to play very much. Um, some people say they are not sure, but there is also a significant number, uh, almost as much as uh, those who think there is a role to play, to say that there is no place for waste incineration in a sustainable future. Okay. Um, I think we can go now to, 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 to hear our speakers and we will maybe then verify at the end, uh, yeah, how, how, how are your, whether you changed your opinion or not, uh, you, can, you will be able to write that in the chat. Thank you. Mariel? Okay, go I'll go back Thanks. to the presentation. Okay, fantastic. So, so yes, as I was saying, uh, we're going to talk about waste to energy incineration in the context of global climate policy and finance. And 
just very briefly, we are a global network of grassroots and organizations in more than 92 countries working on waste and justice. And one of our strategic priorities in the coming years is to be supporting the organizing and advocacy around methane reduction. Many members in our, in our network have been working on the impacts of pollution, of waste disposal pollution, uh, resulting from landfills, from dam sites, from waste to energy incineration. And many members as well are working on implementation of solutions, looking at composting, biogas, anaerobic digestion, and waste prevention at the very top of the solutions, which we call all under the umbrella of a zero waste strategy. So going into the topic, in the context of global climate finance, as you know, since 2021, since at COP26, there was the launch of the Global Methane Pledge, that there's been an increasing momentum around the reduction of methane emissions, with more than 150 countries committing to the reduction of methane emissions by 30% 20, by 2030. And this has driven new financial interest towards the waste sector, as this sector is the third largest sector contributing to anthropogenic methane emissions, emissions that come from landfills and dam sites, mainly from the organic waste that we put in there that contribute to climate change in the form of methane. And coming up, we have in less than one month, we have COP29 round the corner is happening in Azerbaijan, where the climate finance agenda is at the very top of the priorities. And parties to the UNFCCC have to agree on a new climate finance goal. That is an amount of money that it has to be invested to ensure that we meet the targets of the Paris Agreement, ensuring that global warming doesn't go beyond 1.5 degrees. And this is happening at the same time that these parties, most governments around the world, have to update their NDCs, their national climate plans. So their NDCs have to increase in their ambition and now they are all committed, they all have the mandate to, in their, in their run up to COP30, they have to update these NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, which comes to see basically the national climate plan in each country that will determine as well, what are the priorities of this country for their investment? So there's uh, two critical elements here around climate finance being agreed, the amount, but also where do countries want to drive this climate finance? What are going to, these going to be like the priorities, where they want to see the money going and what kind of climate action they want to see happening? And if we look at climate finance for the waste sector to reduce methane emission, what we see so far is what's for a lot of people a harmful financial trend, which is that 99% of climate finance for methane reduction is already going to waste to energy incineration. This is a study that came up uh, from Climate Policy Initiative, a think tank that published this report a couple of years ago. And at the same time, we saw uh, in the last round of NDCs, we published a report looking at all the NDCs and already at the time, 39 out of 99 NDCs that we looked at were supporting already waste to energy incineration and refuse derived fuel. So we see already, we are in a context already where there's already quite a lot of climate finance, most of the climate finance already going to waste to energy incineration and many countries already investing in this, in this technology. Now, this is a problem in the sense that if you see waste to energy incineration, if you think of it in the context of climate, you'll realize that this is a terrible source of energy because it does a net contribution to climate change. It's a greenhouse gas contributor to the atmosphere. So definitely not in the clean, in the low carbon uh, technology side of things. It's extremely toxic to human health. It produces furans, dioxins, heavy metals, particulate matter. And there's evidence of this happening all over the world. And it's very expensive, very expensive technology to deal with waste. So any climate finance that is going to 
waste energy incineration for the purpose of reducing methane actually is swapping methane for CO2, which is unacceptable, understanding the, the guidance from the IPCC, which really calls us to reduce methane as much as CO2, as much as basically reducing mitigation means reducing greenhouse gas emissions and and, and make sure that we, we commit and we are able to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. There is one aspect that is specifically problematic with waste to energy incineration in the global south, which is that it has a negative impact on the livelihoods of vulnerable communities. In the global south, there's 1% of the population, really large um, population that lives off recovering materials from the waste and from the streets. And these are the waste pickers, the informal recyclers, those that when they've received the appropriate support and they've been able to organize, have really built cooperatives, build organizations, build national, regional, global alliances. At today, waste pickers, definitely there's, there's still in the informal sector, but the level of organizing has increased incredibly. And these are in, in the global south, the people that are uh, building and, and maintaining the recycling system, the de facto recycling system. So investing in incineration will create a competition for the same materials and will basically jeopardize and, and make, um, make a direct impact on the livelihoods of these communities, which is completely unacceptable if we are committing to ensuring a just transition in the waste sector. So definitely not a good idea to invest in waste energy incineration, um, but specifically, specifically in the global south, uh, bearing in mind the loss of livelihoods. And this is something that there's the, the problems around waste to ins energy incineration uh, is, is something that is becoming uh, a lot more mainstream. And especially in the in the last years, there's been a lot of a lot of uh, wake up calls that we've been seeing around. But I would say that perhaps one of the most important was the fact that waste to energy incineration was excluded from the sustainable finance taxonomy in the European Union. And the reason why uh, the incineration was excluded was precisely because of the impact on circular economy, understanding that burning resources that could be recyclable, that could be reused, that could be prevented in the first place, definitely. It doesn't make sense uh, resource-wise. It doesn't make sense circular economy-wise. And also for the impact on climate change that I was mentioning before. Just last week, impressive research from the BBC considered and concluded that waste to energy incineration is now the dirtiest source of energy in the UK. But also Denmark, a country that has been relying on incineration for many years and, and one at the top of European uh, Union uh, relying on this technology, a few years ago, the parliament agreed to reducing 30% of incineration capacity, which is equivalent to shutting down seven incinerators, precisely because of this contribution to climate change. But also Norway, another country in the north of Europe that has been relying on this model now, coming to terms with these uh, failed waste policies. So we're seeing this, the countries precisely that at the time relied on incineration the most are now going through the painful process of realizing that they need to change the approach. They are committed to the infrastructure is committing to waste to energy incineration. It's created a lock-in situation, which is what happens uh, because this very inflexible um, infrastructure. So, and now, and, and yet they are now definitely committed to pedal back and reduce this capacity because it's contradicting its climate targets and circular economy targets and air pollution and livelihoods of people. So what do we do instead? What do we do instead? We look at the waste hierarchy and we look at the very top and we focus on the solutions that can provide the highest impact. And especially looking at waste methane emissions, we actually know that they can be reduced up to 95% thanks to waste segregation, composting, biostabilization, and biologically active cover for landfills and dam sites. Waste prevention is always at the top, and at the bottom we have landfill and incineration as those, those, those technologies that we should not be supporting. 
there's many examples around the world of how this is taking place. I've just selected a couple of examples to give you a sense of what is happening, but this is honestly just like the tip of the iceberg because there's many groups, communities, cities committing to zero waste goals that are showing that these solutions are implementable, they are feasible, they are affordable. And if anything, we need more political will and more financial resources to make sure that we are able to replicate and scale up these solutions. But just to mention Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, where we had the pleasure to be last July in the International Zero Waste Cities Conference, and we held as well a Methane Action and Environmental Action Summit. Uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Nipe Fajio is the local organization that has implemented a zero waste strategy, has supported the organization of waste speakers, and in the Vonyogwa Ward, one uh, place in, in Dar es Salaam that is now a worldwide reference for zero waste solutions, they are collecting the waste from 4,500 households ensuring 100% diversion of the organic waste diversion from disposal, reducing the equivalent to almost 17 tons of methane emissions per year. Um, definitely uh, one of the groundbreaking examples in Africa that we want to see growing, that we want to see replicating, that we want to see scaling up um, across the region and across the global south. But there's many more in Africa. This is like just one that um, that that came up. And I want to mention also San Fernando in the Philippines, which is, again, one of the um, leading cities of the Zero Way Cities Network in the Philippines, uh, a place that they were diverting 12% of waste from landfill in 2012. And five years later, in 2018, they rose to uh, this, this percentage to 80%, which is, I think, a very uh, impressive figure. And they want to keep going. Ambition doesn't end. They want to, they have like for next year, 91%. Um, please go to our case studies uh, that we have in our website. And I've put the links here and we're going to share it as well in the chat box and um, so that you are able to to see how, how these local organizations uh, made it happen. This is me. I look forward to the discussion and, and the questions that may come. Thank you very much for having us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. That was very comprehensive, also shocking, by seeing how much financing is now diver uh, going into solutions that, uh, that uh, according to the arguments you mentioned, are not um, uh, socially right, that are also very expensive. So the cost benefit here is probably not, uh, not so good. We can look into that more. Um, also the, the pollutions. Um, but what was very also striking is the, the lock-in effect. So I wanted, may, can I have already a question to you very quick, actually? Why do you think that there is still, even if we have so, such a compelling um, list of arguments and, um, and different associations of waste pickers are there? I know, I don't know any waste picker association that would be supporting waste incineration. Uh, we have recyclers, we have circular economy advocates, but still we have um, a solution that is linear, that is waste incineration, pushed so much by so many stakeholders and accepted by the banks and politicians. What is the question? Okay, why, why, does, why is it so that uh, those arguments do not speak uh, to politicians or to the banks or to financing institutions? 99% going to waste incineration instead of the uh, solutions that you know, have probably much better capex uh, uh, and, and uh, don't, uh, don't influence negatively the social um, level, the social matters uh, here and as well climate, a better climate for climate. There's many reasons. I would like to highlight the lack of criteria of financial institutions as one of them that I see today. I think that the sustainable finance taxonomy in the European Union was a remarkable experience and remarkable job that the European Commission pushed forward. Um, we followed the process and it was it was quite a long process. There was a very wide consultation and I feel that there was a lot of expertise in the room that really uh, were able to maintain the scientific criteria along on, on the 
or the what are really the the, the environmental uh, activities that need to be uh, at the forefront of climate action. And I feel that sometimes the, these environmental criteria uh, are put on the side uh, when it comes to economics and, and profitability from uh, a few stakeholders. And, and I suppose that there's um, large industries that are able to push for the interests rather than the interest of local organizations and, and local communities mm. and vulnerable communities like the way speakers that tend to be more marginalized. And when this happens, when the, the, the criteria and the interest of the few goes in front of the interest of the many, we have a situation where also the environmental criteria can be put on the side. And I think it's really time that the environmental institutions like the ADB or the World Bank or the IMF, um, these, these organizations really need to commit to the Paris Agreement agenda, really need to update their criteria and, and, and push forward for a methane taxonomy or a, or a you know, a, a financial, sustainable finance taxonomy at the global level that really clarifies and really uh, make sure to, to give criteria to governments, which are often overwhelmed by uh, a lot of problems that are often not having even enough capacity to decide what are the investments that they want for their countries. Uh, governments that are under the pressure of debt, under the pressure of uh, a very strong um, um, you know, influence from financial institutions. And I, so I think that definitely now when climate finance is so much on the agenda, I, I do think that international institutions, it's time for them to step up their criteria and their guidance on what is sustainability and the financial mm -hmm. side of things. Thanks, thanks for that. Indeed, the EU taxonomy shows, shows how, how those uh, limitations can be, yeah, um, better addressed. Um, I mean, the definitions also, what we consider sustainable and climate friendly when, for investments, they are maybe confused now. I see many interesting links uh, shared. Uh, so I also had the pleasure to see that good case example in Dar es Salaam. Uh, I shared the link here. But there is also a question, but we'll come back to that. But we are speaking about waste incineration today, not about the broad waste to energy, because as we know, gross ener waste to energy has really many different uh, applications. It can be um, capture of gas from landfills. It can be also anaerobic digestion, which is anaerobic digestion is actually good. Uh, okay, we can also discuss about that. Or uh, gasification. Those we will not touch today too much, uh, but I'm sure we will divert uh, in some discussions. There is also a question that uh, waste incineration has a lot of scrubbers and filters. And I think uh, maybe, um, uh, Janek, you can just maybe now or in the question session reply to that. There is no filter, however, to collect CO2 emissions. And this is the problem here. As you mentioned in the UK and some links also in the chat, this is now the most um, emitting uh, waste installation source of energy in UK because we all go into more renewable grids. So naturally, more and more countries will face the same problem. Uh, and if we are serious about climate change, I think that is something very important to address and to understand. So, um, okay, uh, but in the, in the, on the way to circular economy, to zero waste, we still have residual waste there. So I would like to ask Janek, who I know you developed um, some alternatives to this transition, how we deal with residuals in the meantime, as we uh, aim the, to the, you know, to the zero waste, to the goal, even if we never achieve zero, total zero. So what we do with those residuals in the meantime, and also to reduce their environmental impact. Uh, Janek. Yeah, thank okay, you, Piotr. Screen, yes, I'm. I'm. I'm going to put the uh, slides on so you can uh, see. So yes, I uh, also good afternoon uh, from from my side. Um, as Piotr said, my my name is Janek Wach. I um, I I work for Zero Waste Europe as Zero Pollution Policy Manager. Uh, this topic is is definitely a, a key focus of my work. I've been spending nine years of my. Uh, <laughs> my time on that. Um, there's been a lot of interesting developments happening uh, uh, during that period. And actually, I must say that uh, and the European Union is also, um, let's say, uh, 
working on its new vision. And uh, um, if somebody says like uh, incineration is, is, is the solution, for example, um, what we hear now in Africa or in Asia or anywhere, then I would say that this, is, this was a solution maybe uh, um, some years ago. And now, um, definitely, EU is is moving away from it. But it's also a question of like, so what is the the new direction to take? And uh, I will be speaking about um, uh, a strategy that we are putting forward, and I'm looking very much forward um, to debate this with you, which is called material recovery and biological treatment, or in short, MRPT. And honestly, we believe this concept uh, offers a global solution to managing uh, mixed waste, uh, particularly uh, due to the increasing importance of reducing uh, um, waste sectors' uh, contribution to climate change. So this discussion is definitely very, very important and even more so uh, timely. Um, uh, so, but before, before we go into uh, uh, discussing what is MRPT, uh, I wanted to clarify the definition of mixed waste. Uh, it's uh, in Europe sometimes also called residual waste. I absolutely disagree with this, uh, this name um, uh, for the different reasons. Um, uh, I will come just, just in a second to this, uh, but this is basically, this is waste uh, that is left after doing separate collections. So this is the kind of household waste. It's not industrial waste or, or municipal waste, uh, uh, which is left after separate collections. So it depends obviously from uh, uh, what is the composition of, um, of the mixed waste um, and what kind of collections you do. Eh? So it, it, it is a direct relationship. Eh? Um, I just wanted to uh, give you a good ex two, uh, two examples of cities which uh, uh, are have a good level of separate collections, as you uh, as you can see. Uh, however, uh, still a significant amount of material end up in uh, in mixed waste, uh, and and some of them. Uh, um, so, if you can see, for example, there is a lot of uh, different types of plastics, um, plastic packaging, which is normally quite recyclable. Also, plastic tableware, some other types of uh, plastics, uh, but also a lot of paper. Um, roughly, you, you can see like 40%, 21%. It's quite high, high amount. And then some other things like bio waste um, and, and some other materials. Um, and actually, with the modern technologies, quite a, num quite a, a number of these could be actually recovered. And I, uh, why this is important? Because in, in, in my in, uh, opinion, uh, the goal of any uh, waste management strategy for mixed waste uh, should be based on understanding the composition of, of mixed waste and, and also, of course, what is separately collected uh, because it helps us to um, ensure that this waste is handled in the most sustainable way. Yeah? And it is also important uh, that this system has to uh, be uh, flexible so it allows for uh, improvements in separate collections as we learn more. Yeah? And, and therefore, it, it would prevent us getting stuck with systems such as like uh, incineration that, as we know, relies on continued production of waste. So this uh, leads us to the uh, new concept. So in 2020, uh, um, we launched our paper on uh, MRPT. We call it a, a bridge strategy for, uh, for residual waste or mixed waste. Um, uh, bridge because we see that it bridges um, the moving from uh, a lot of mixed waste towards uh, less less and less um, uh, mixed waste, so towards more waste prevention, reuse, and and also recycling. Yeah? And um, as as Piotr said, um, uh, unfortunately, even Europe. Um, let's be honest, uh, we are often. Uh, promoting ourselves as having our uh, best practices and but we have uh, we are still have we are stuck with uh, uh, roughly 50% uh, uh, of waste is still mixed waste and i think uh, it's got to do something with how the the waste management strategies were designed and they are definitely now outdated and they were designed something like 40 years ago there has been some reforms here and there but it's still very much focused on uh, on incineration and it has not really led to any kind of improvement there. So this new strategy that we are proposing um, relies on uh, biological treatment, 
to um, stabilize the organics that is still left in, um, in mixed waste with the sorting equipment. Uh, it's not mandatory, but it's, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like of, um, aim to also recover materials that still um, find their way to, uh, to mixed waste. And uh, this way you will actually um, minimize the impact of landfilling, um, but also keep the system uh, uh, flexible. I, I'm going to just very quickly go through. I don't want to go into too many technicalities, but basically uh, just for you to see, um, it's very simple. We have, it basically involves uh, three quiz sections. Uh, I think you can see my, uh, my mouse here. So basically the first section is separation of, of dry materials from organics. So it's a use of primary screens to divide uh, the waste. Uh, so large dry materials such as paper, plastics, and metals are separated from uh, smaller organics. And this is, and then uh, there will be follow-up, uh, so-called mechanical sorting uh, for those dry materials, where you basically, um, yeah, undergo sorting uh, with various equipment. You can use uh, ballistic separators, optical sorters for plastics, for example, and magnets for the metals and so on. Uh, and then the last section is, is actually the biological treatment section um, for organics, where you are, uh, do a compost-like process to reduce its ability to uh, ferment. Um, so yeah, it's very simple. And what is interesting about this concept is that you can actually um, use it for both treating uh, mixed waste, meaning that you know, for sorting and biologically stabilizing the, the organic fraction, but you could also sort this, uh, sorry, uh, you could also use it for um, uh, materials that are separate collected. And in fact, it's already done um, in many places in, uh, in across Europe, uh, where you have like, let's say like uh, Monday and Wednesday, you are, uh, you treat, uh, you sort and um, uh, mixed waste, and then on other days you uh, you basically sort uh, the materials which come from a um, separate separate collection. So it's it's a kind of flexible system, and it helps you to uh, move towards um, um, a kind of more sorting of separate collected materials as you get better in uh, encapsulating those materials via separate collections. So um, just uh, some. I'm just going to go through some uh, some uh, some kind of uh, uh, data to back up this 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 strategy, just because just to just to show how interesting and how useful it can be, and but it also what it costs and 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 what it does for climate. So I'm just gonna just to give you some idea on terms of like uh, the recovery rates and the minimization of the waste that is left over after this process. So as you can see, it's, it's roughly reduces the amount by, by 50%. It's, it's due uh, because you are, you do recover materials, particularly plastics and metals, but you can also do paper, cardboard, and even some other materials. And then also uh, the biological stabilization uh, of the organics, it reduces also the amount of, uh, of uh, wet kind of humid uh, organics because of this decomposition of, uh, of the material and the loss of humidity. Yeah? So it's roughly 50% waste left. This is important because it uh, also, <laughs> also influences the cost and particularly here in Europe. So we did another study um, in terms of understanding, so what are the costs of doing such a, such a um, uh, kind of system? And we, we look at into the 100,000 and 200, thousand tons of waste per year facilities. We, uh, we purposely wanted to have it um, kind of uh, small because you could also go for 500,000 uh, tons uh, facilities. But we, uh, we know that waste should be going down in the future. Uh, and also we want to have an infrastructure which is sort of like uh, not locking in and so on and more kind of uh, uh, flexible and, uh, and, and community uh, oriented. So. Um, what we saw is that, of course, uh, the, the main cost item here, it's not actually the equipment. The equipment is very cheap. It's actually the landfill tax because you still continue landfilling. Yeah? Uh, so that is the, the big penalization for this kind of system. But, uh, you know, these things can, can change. Uh, um, so the, what is interesting you can see here is that actually you also, uh, you have a revenues uh, by pulling out materials and selling them. 
and 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 then you also actually uh, reduce the amount of uh, waste by by 50%. Therefore, you also you uh, reduce the, the the kind of penalties coming from continuing uh, disposing some waste. So it's actually quite interesting. And of course, when you scale up this system, it becomes even more interesting. The cost, uh, the capital cost, and operating cost they go down. Um, just very quickly, uh, uh, since climate is, is really, really uh, uh, one of the key arguments nowadays for, um, for, for, yeah, for any kind of treatment, then uh, I wanted to just show you this graph here. It basically, um, you can see if you go from, uh, from the bottom line is the, um, is the kind of MRPT uh, with the recycling benefit added. So it's the benefit of pulling out materials and, and not burning them actually has the, the, the least climate impact. And then, uh, yeah, you can see like incineration is, is much higher, even if you have a, a recovery of uh, energy from the process. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's actually interesting because it's, it really uh, reduces the climate impact significantly. And just to, uh, so some of the takeaways from, uh, uh, from uh, from me uh, would be uh, I'm very much hoping that the future uh, waste management for the residuals or mixed waste should really consider MRPT types of solutions um, because it allows to recover recyclables, it um, it stabilizes org organics, uh, which could be in some cases uh, in some restricted cases also used uh, for uh, for certain purposes. Um, I would also say that MRPT facilities, they are flexible. As I said, they can have this uh, dual duty or double duty uh, where you combine treatment of mixed waste with separate collection uh, outputs. Uh, so you can actually flexibly improve what you are doing in waste collection systems. You don't lock in low recycling rates for that reason. So it's not a system that locks you in, uh, rather the opposite. Actually, you can just use more and more of the, the capacities for managing the, um, uh, the kind of waste that comes from uh, via separate collections. And, and also this system is actually very quick to implement. It's very cost effective. It's cost like uh, a fraction of what costs uh, waste incineration. It's climate friendly, absolutely. And, and, and yeah, as I said, capital commitment is far lower than uh, it's for incinerators. So I really believe that this could present uh, um, a global solution. So I'll stop here and looking forward to uh, all the questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for showing this alternative that for me, apart from the takeaways you mentioned, the flexibility is important because we haven't touched about that much. The lock-in effect that was mentioned by Mariel, by Mariel that uh, huge investments for many years will lock us in uh, generation of waste in amounts that will be sufficient to feed those incinerators or other yeah or incinerators this one is much more flexible because one is much cheaper no but it can also be transformed into treating select uh, separately collected waste at some point as well to to compost it in a to, to a cleaner compost but in the meantime it can treat also the mixed waste and biostabilize it and therefore reduce the 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 methane emissions uh, from from that fraction um, there are there is one uh, question I would like to ask uh, from 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 the questions, but yeah, okay, one question. So there it is it is contested that actually landfills are much more polluting than incinerators. Um, is it the fact today uh, everywhere, and why is that? And yeah. Well, I mean, I we actually did a report uh, quite recently. I think it was uh, a few months ago where where we focused on uh, 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 bio-stabilization. Uh, um, and, and this strategy, because you, you are basically, you remove the humidity and, and th because this is really the problem and the humidity of the waste, which creates these leakages and, and creates this kind of toxic, toxic uh, uh, ambience in, in, in landfills. Uh, uh, the problem is, unfortunately, that uh, many strategies are focused on energy recovery from landfills. So they are trying to cash capture. And this strategy, um, it does not pre-treat the, the waste before you landfill. And therefore, 
all the humidity is in there. And also uh, just uh, actually we saw, for example, in the UK, they, uh, they, they were relying on having a very high capture rates and they, they reviewed their they views on, on uh, meat and capture because actually in reality, a lot of it happens just in the, at the very beginning. Uh, and, and the same for the toxicity. So, so really, uh, if, you, if you don't want landfills to, um, um, to, uh, um, yeah, to be safe, actually, if you want them to be safe, you should do the biostabilization. Okay. And also, I would recommend also pull out as many materials as you can, because then the least you have a less material basically ending up in there mm. to create this kind yeah. of uh, problem in the first place. Thanks. I also think that most of the landfills that are currently today, they were designed many years ago where oh, yeah. they still had, you know, not all those practices before oh, yeah. uh, pretreatment, but new landfills that are needed in, uh, in many countries still, because we'll not yes. go, even with incineration, that is... We, you still have to landfill quite some um, uh, oh, amount absolutely. of uh, hazardous waste. But we can come back to that. Uh, we have, um, among the list of participants, uh, I have seen few local um, experts, and I would like to ask them now to share their one minute, two minutes opinion and also uh, alternative possibly. So I will start with Europe, uh, Bulgaria, Danita from Zazemiata, if you can, uh, no, uh, Yes, that's Anita from Zazemiata. What is your story with the incineration in Sofia? Uh, hello, everyone. I don't know why this name breaks. It's written. I, I've tried to change it, but my name is Danita and I'm coming from Bulgaria. I work in Zazemiata. This is a um, Bulgarian organization, Friends of the Earth, Bulgaria. Uh, yeah, I'd like to share in very briefly the the story of the incinerator in Sofia. Uh, we had a very big victory last year. We stopped uh, this uh, incinerator. Um, and I will tell you first why we were opposing it. Uh, there were a f it's, a, it's a project um, for uh, 180,000 tons of waste to be burned in the capital city of uh, Bulgaria. Uh, this was a municipal project um, and it was, um, it started like, uh, this project became popular like 10 years ago um, because uh, there were uh, public consultations in these times. So we opposed it because of many problematic aspects, ecological, health, uh, financial. Um, in the environmental impact assessment, uh, there was no enough information about the measures uh, taken mm. uh, against creation of dioxins, even about the monitoring of dioxins. Um, there was no cumulative analysis of how this project will influence uh, the air in Sofia, and actually we live now even already in a very polluted uh, area. Um, and of course, there was there was no analysis of the health status of the population, um, and it it wasn't it was impossible to to monitor the health status. Um, and there was so, so what happened? So what happened? They stopped it, and now what? <laughs> Um, actually, it was a really long battle. Uh, we've um, we've organized many protests, many actions, videos, uh, but the municipality tried to to hidden them. Uh, but uh, we started a court case, like it was a battle in the court of nine years. And at the end, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, they, they had the final decision and say that uh, they, they are stopping this uh, project um, because of all these aspects that, uh, that I um, mentioned before. Okay. Um, and now, actually, the situation uh, is um, changing every day uh, because still the municipality is producing RDF. And this is a problem because this RDF now will be burned in different cities around the country. Um, so the other people will take the responsibility of our waste. Uh, but there is a new uh, municipal government and uh, they try to 
um, to make better the separate collection, the the recycle yeah. to, to separate the recyclables, to separate the bio waste. This is a very very important part, um, and to inform people during these uh, ten and more the years. Uh, we had a successful campaign for information people uh, the people how how very bad is incineration and that mm -hmm. we have to find uh, solutions in a different way um thank you danita let, let me summarize because what is most important is that first of all congratulations uh, it means it seems like arguments spoke but what is also very emblematic is that i've seen that in many municipalities once you stop the shortcut uh, non creative so uh, solution people start to think, you know, yeah, you start to think, you have to prevent waste generation, you have to separately collect, and you find, uh, you you reduce the problem while finding a solution or, yeah, and then you, the solution might appear to be also cheaper. Thank you, that's from Europe. We also have colleagues from Africa and from Asia. If I may now maybe invite, uh, let's say, uh, okay, Leslie, Leslie from Nigeria. There is also, please share your story shortly, yeah? One, two minutes uh, and what is now, the status. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Poita. Um, uh, the case of uh, um, Nigeria comes from Lagos State, where we have the Lagos State government uh, just very early in this year, engaging in what we call a very ambitious um, uh, project, uh, totally driven uh, from top to bottom, uh, a waste to energy incineration plant. Uh, the idea was basically, or uh, is, to basically decommission one of the largest waste dump sites in Nigeria called the Epe Dump Site. And uh, they went ahead to sign an MOU. Let, let me start first by saying Lagos State typically, uh, the waste stream from Lagos is typically of about 60 to 80% organics and biodegradables. Um, of course, again, we know that this has been a huge challenge, waste management problems in Lagos, uh, which is one of the largest cities in Nigeria. Uh, in the absence of any sanitary landfill in the first case, it's just open uh, landfills or dump sites. So in one of these dump sites in a pair, the Lagos State Government is signing an MOU as a way of decommissioning these landfills. I heard you talk about uh, the merits be, be, be behind the uh, landfill as well as its incinerator not too long ago. So in on this project, a very gigantic Netherlands uh, uh, Dutch company project, uh, if, uh, if, if I can mention, that is uh, Harvest Waste, uh, we'll be committing, is trying to put in place um, about uh, uh, 3,000 tons uh, daily, uh, an incinerator facility that is going to at least take out 3,000 tons of waste from the over 14,000 tons waste in Lagos. Now, that's, that's uh, this is an ambitious... Sorry? Yeah, that's 1 million tons a year. Crazy. Exactly, exactly. And uh, because of John, all the reasons haven't been stated here, I mean, which we all know, uh, Gaia Nigeria as a team, we, this, we, we didn't see this as a good omen for us because, again, no incinerator in Africa has worked. We are quite aware of examples of uh, the Ethiopian gigantic incinerator. Last week I was with my Ethiopia colleagues in Nairobi and nothing is working. It's just uh, nothing has worked. So just like you have in many other developed countries. We engaged the Lagos state government when we heard about this MOU. Uh, signed of about, um, they're going to be committing almost about 120 million euro. We just think that is a financial project. And we, we engage with them. Okay, and, Leslie, uh, Leslie, can I ask you now, be, uh, how would you like this 120 million euro to be diverted to create a solution? Obviously, you can't put 20, 120,000 million, like the utopian case is even more than that. And the whole money went to drain. We think we have pushed to the Lagos state government that the best approach, the best, wisest way to use this money is through uh, a, a zero waste approach, you know, waste segregation and source. And we have organized, apart from the protest, we, 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 we made to the government, it was signed worldwide. Uh, it doesn't look like they want to back out because they are really looking at this 120 million, which is not sustainable. We are proposing that, look, just a little chunk of this, 
can manage the entire solid waste, uh, you know, organic waste in Lagos. You're looking at, Absolutely. I mean, this is purely like yeah. transporting, you're going to be transporting from mainland to the island, organic waste of purely water, you know. So all this we are pushed to the Lagos State government. Um, we had conferences. It seems like they are listening, but we are not sure they, 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 they want to take their eyes off this. Yeah, so yeah. that's why we think that um, the you know, thank Lagos you. Thank being you, the global... Okay, okay. All yeah, right. thank you, Dr. Azagame. Um, this is very important. If you can share in the chat the the letter, I know you send a letter to the Lagos Authority. Just share it in the chat or your colleague from another colleague from Nigeria so that we see what you suggested as a solution, uh, as you explained. Excellent, and, uh, excellent. I, thank I, you. I'll do that, you, Preta. Sir. I'll do that. Thank you. I would like to go to Asia and ask quickly also what is, uh, I think, Philippines. That's Brex. Uh, what is the story there? And I remember there was a moratorium for incineration, but there is still uh, this uh, push. Uh, you're muted. Uh, yeah. yeah no. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah, yes, Piotr, you're, you're correct. In the Philippines, there is actually a moratorium, a ban uh, on incineration that's been around for about 25 years at this point. However, what we're seeing is that uh, even if there is such a ban, there are some loopholes that some companies and some local governments are able to exploit. Um, so now we have... At, at least at this point, maybe at least 10 incinerators in the country with another at least 29 incinerators in the pipeline within the next decade. Uh, now, these are planned. These are under construction. Um, some of these are already approved. And some of these are also uh, being um, qualified for renewable energy subsidies, as crazy as that sounds, um, wherein uh, companies are able to classify them as biomass incineration. But the issue there is, and this is the issue, not just in the Philippines, but really across South, Southeast Asia and Asia and the wider Asia Pacific, is that waste tends to be mixed in nature. So that when there is no um, guarantee that when uh, any sort of waste goes into an incinerator, that it is uh, properly segregated, that only the residuals will be burned and so on. Mm. So you have a lot of uh, potential over here. You have uh, uh, one thing to note over here is, um, looking back at Marielle's slide earlier about the millions of uh, waste workers, uh, for example, in Dar es Salaam and in um, San Fernando in the Philippines, who are working on zero waste solutions, you have in um, Egypt Pacific, at the very least, around 50 to 70 percent of the waste is organic, meaning there is a huge potential in composting and, uh, and means other than combustion or pyrolysis or gasification. Um, and just to note that, because um, I, I saw that I saw this in the chat. Just to note, so a lot of these um, these technologies, which are being branded as clean, there are many case studies in Asia Pacific showing that they are actually not clean. Um, the companies do not give out their monitoring reports, so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll probably stop there for a minute. The, thank you, Rex. Uh, yeah, if you can share those case studies about gasification mm. and pyrolysis, I, I know there was a discussion on the chat. I want to say we are speaking about waste incineration, but uh, if, yeah, yes. please continue in the chat to feed people in, with the correct information. Um, I also heard from your composting. I heard from uh, Dr. Leslie on composting. Indeed, if in developing countries, this is the main chunk of waste. Why don't we get this first done if, uh, if technologies are there much more? Uh, much cheaper and also in line with circular economy, bringing nutrients back. So I'm happy someone said that in Lagos, there is actually a project on composting by Zoom Lion. I think this is a big uh, company from Ghana. So there will be, yeah, from Accra. So, so yeah, no, we need, we need all scales, small and big scales as well, but uh, of, the, of, the, of the facilities that are really needed. And just the last one intervention before we, on, uh, do we have Kate here still? There was, yes, Kate. From South Africa, so going back to Africa again, I've heard your story is more successful. So please share, uh, that is uh, Kate from Cape Town. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, Hi. yes we can hear you. Hi, um, yeah, thank you for um, inviting me just to, to, just have a, to just share with, with you our uh, success story. We, uh, I'm the uh, CEO of the Zero Waste Association of South Africa, and um, several, uh, about 15 years ago, we successfully uh, stopped uh, or opposed the construction of a large waste incinerator in a, in a small uh, farming town uh, mm -hmm. of Wellington, South Africa. 
and um, we uh, and and this waste incinerator would have uh, uh, been built in an environment where the municipality itself generated less than two hundred tons of uh, of waste, um, but the uh, waste incinerator needed more than seven hundred tons of of waste in order to um, keep it financially sustainable, which meant that the waste would have would have had to be imported either from neighboring municipalities or from overseas. Um, but also the fact is that um, the municipality had done no previous any uh, separation of a, or of waste at source, particularly organic waste at source. Uh, so it would have essentially burnt uh, mixed waste with all the hazardous waste, waste included. Uh, but there are many other reasons why we opposed um, this waste incinerator. Um, but the fact is that um, the municipality never attempted um, zero waste circular economy systems, which have been which have proven to be successful all over the world. For example, in Treviso province, uh, which uh, currently achieves a residual waste of 41 kgs per person per year. Um, in South Africa, the average residual waste per person per year is about one ton. Uh, per person per year. Uh, so uh, there is no doubt that zero waste should first be tried before even considering any other 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 system because it certainly is the most the the, the, the most effective uh, system. And we and and so we are um, successful successfully applying a uh, zero waste circular economy system system in uh, in a, another municipality. And uh, we hoping to achieve a zero, 100% um, diversion of organic waste by, by 2027. But my concern that I wish to express to, um, to all the listeners and, um, on this program, on, the, on this webinar, is the fact that South Africa, despite the fact that we successfully opposed and stopped uh, this, this waste incinerator from being built in South Africa, um, South Africa is now being, uh, there is an onslaught of uh, waste incinerator lobbyists operating in our country, and uh, some municipalities are considering uh, waste incineration as, as, a, as an option. Uh, the problem is that many of the waste incinerator uh, 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 lobbies are uh, supported by large international financial institutions, um, which means that these these transactions are usually very difficult to stop, especially if there's been uh, financing under the under the table uh, to the key decision makers. Um, and hence the need for us, uh, if we wish to uh, to stop these these uh, these waste incinerators from being built, we need to have at least a reserve of funds, uh, to take appropriate legal action, uh, and and also to serve as a as a deterrent to um, the the key decision makers and the and the lobbyists. Um, so I I feel that um, protest actions are are very very important. However, they are limited, um, especially when there are large transactions involved, and hence the need for for us globally to come together and start up a, a reserve fund in order to, to, uh, to fight uh, these, these incinerator um, issues in court. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Kate. You. you raised the point really of the communities that I also often fa face. Um, but I, I also feel very sorry that we have to spend time and money to fight something uh, instead of looking at solutions, yeah, I mean, we know the solutions, but we just are, we have our hands busy with fighting them, th those, those wrong solutions. So, yeah, I think what Mario uh, was exp expressing in the beginning, driving the financing uh, straight into the good solutions, that is something we have to upstream, like look the, with the banks. So they, and with those governments that, as you said, international are, are influencing. I've heard that from, so from another colleague for, uh, that in South Africa, a lot of international influencing is happening in Lagos as well as, as we just heard from Dr. Leslie. So, um, yeah, um, if um, 
we can come back to financing if you, Mario, you want to add something on that. But I have also some list of questions here in the chat because now we can move to questions. Sorry, also I have to say apologies from uh, Shalini Goyalvala from International Council for Circular Economy. She sent me a message she couldn't make it unless, no, she's not there yet. Okay, so there will be other, uh, other uh, opportunities to hear to Shalini. Uh, okay, so that's why we still have some time for questions. Um, if any of the speakers would like to react already, otherwise I will take some questions from the chat. Okay, there was one question from one colleague um, on medical waste. Yeah, we speak here about waste incineration of municipal solid waste, but how about medical waste? There are also other alternatives or solutions there. It's also a different kind of waste, let's be honest, right? Yannick, you're nodding. A few words about this. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a medical waste expert, but um, I know that actually uh, there's a lot of resources uh, being developed or uh, by, uh, by different networks, um, uh, for example, uh, Healthcare Without Harm and also the IPEN network. And um, I can just tell you, um, again, you know, I can't give you a concrete answers on specific things to do, but um, when it comes to a, a EU sustainable finance taxonomy, basically it, it, um, this is also addressed in there. So they have a list of technologies that you can use as alternatives to waste incineration uh, when it comes to medical waste. And I know hospitals are very interested in, uh, in uh, um, you know, having alternatives. So they, they, mm. develop, they, they, they are kind of like requesting for that. So, mm -hmm. so I guess this whole short answer, yeah. <laughs> yes. If you can paste the link to that. But also oh, important yeah, to say that not all waste that comes of hospitals are hazardous. It's really small fraction that is hazardous. Most of it is bio waste and it's plastics. So yeah. maybe that's also important to remember that, uh, yeah, when we speak about waste incineration, uh, the, the incineration of medical waste is a small fraction and we are not really addressing here uh, too much. But there are, there are also other solutions. There is also a question on, uh, uh, yeah, that uh, the dioxins are, I think Mario, you said about dioxins, that they can be destroyed in extremely high temperatures. That's why waste incineration call it uh, um, a best available option. Mm. But how, how energy efficient is it also? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so the studies on pollution from incinerators have uh, explain that the creation of pollution dioxins and fuels is mainly in in it's not in the the whole time that the, the waste is burning is is mainly in in the the change of temperatures and it's in this change of temperatures that is like the biggest creation of pollution. Now that happens because the waste is heterogeneous, so it's actually really difficult to maintain the same amount of temperature. And there's also there's going to be times that the incinerator like uh, stops or restarts or there's like it's not that this is a system that it's always. Uh, absolutely stable. There's going to be changes and in those changes there's going to be release of pollution. That's why in principle there is monitoring of pollution and this monitoring of pollution however it tends to be very insufficient and this is what we see when uh, in several incinerators in Europe where the regulation has been established for some time where there is, in principle, an institutional support that is able to do the monitoring. What it happens in practice is that very often this monitoring is not happening and the pollution um, is, is out there. And in this uh, thing, Zero Waste Europe has been doing excellent work in this sense like with case studies on a specific incinerators in the Netherlands, the REC incinerator is a is a well known case. Uh, but also uh, in Spain, in 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 the UK, we've seen the 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 BBC research. Like Rancon incinerator is very near where I live, and you know that you don't need a lot of studies to see like when the neighbors are complaining that the the car is full of ash and that it smells and there is pollution and 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 so on and. Again, I want to mention the zero with zero biomonitoring research that has shown the levels of pollution. So the pollution happens and there's going to be, you know, circumstances that will make it 
bigger or lower, of course, and there's the whole filters uh, question that may also improve, but uh, the pollution is still there. And then the pollution is still there and also resource-wise and greenhouse gas emissions-wise, it is still doesn't make sense, but it, is, it will always be better to reduce the waste, to reuse, to recycle, than actually burn materials that could be saved uh, for the future. So energy-wise, definitely not efficient. Pollution-wise, definitely not a good option. And on top of that, there is the question of the expensive, how uh, unaffordable mm -hmm. it is, and the lock-in effect. So it's really, it's really, really uh, hard actually to make the case for incineration. Um, and really, on the on the basis of what science really is telling us that we should move away from incineration. Mm -hmm. And and now that climate emergency is upon us more than ever, mm -hmm. it's really time that we change that we change gears. So, so thank you, Maril. So I will be the waste incineration industry now. I'll answer. The case for us is that in Africa, there is no waste management. That's why in Lagos, a country, a city of 20 million, there is so much waste and we cannot do much about it. So yeah, I think yeah, the Yannick solution also showed that there is ways to, ways to do it, even cheaper, then can be of different scale and most important, um, scalable and flexible. And waste, in, uh, waste pickers will be involved in it. While do you have some jobs maybe, um, data or like experiences, how much jobs are really created in the system that Yannick suggested, that uh, zero waste uh, promotes uh, versus what is created by waste installation? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite clearly I, um, <laughs> the biological treatment, which is a compost-like system and, and sorting facilities. Even though in the sorting facilities nowadays, you, um, you rely more and more on uh, uh, let's say on on a kind of uh, sorting uh, equipment, but it, some of it can be done also mechanically. Um, uh, it it does great uh, jobs. Um, I mean, it's 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 not going to be like uh, 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 lots of them, but you know because it's, uh, you have a facility that's nowadays to sort, and which is actually in a way good also because it keeps it kind of like the hygienic aspect is then kind of eliminated because you maybe don't want necessarily people to touch that. Um, but the biological treatment, as I said, is again it's like really like a compost like uh, where you need to have people working. And, and so I, it's hard to say, like, again, it depends on uh, uh, how big the facilities are. Uh, there are mm -hmm. dens or dozens or, or 20s or, or more, depending on, on the size of the facility. Mm -hmm. That's about the facility, but the, the more uh, large concept of zero waste also generates uh, work, uh, jobs from yeah, the reuse I mean, through recycling, right? Yeah. Yes, just, just to add, I mean, it's, it's yes, it, it, it definitely creates uh, a few more, so, few more jobs, but it's, it's, it actually saves a lot of money, uh, which is also important. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. and it's more compatible, it's kind of more uh, environmentally just and, mm -hmm. and for the peoples and, and so on, and, um, and more uh, fits with, uh, with the, uh, getting better in, in waste management. And, and so there's a lot of variety of, you should not just look at one aspect, there's a range of aspects. Yeah. Uh, Th thank you. I think, we, yes, we are convinced. But I saw when I mentioned Lagos, I saw Dr. Leslie uh, putting up the camera and I wanted to ask you that the argument is energy. Let's get energy. And Nigeria is in a problem of energy. And also, yes, the, the, the jobs, jobs in such a city of Lagos are very needed. So how do you address this then? Sorry, um, are you talking about jobs or about, I mean, besides- Jobs and energy, well, well, just say jobs and energy, of those two problems network. that, okay. Um, just say, please, uh, the situation in Lagos in terms yeah, of the I'm energy need. Okay. It's the delay. Go ahead. Well, when you talk about energy need, this is really a deception, you know, um, as we very much know that, yes, there is some energy poverty as far as, uh, you know, Lagos uh, meeting its 12 million population, but definitely we are sure. I, 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 I made a statement and I gave the case of Ethiopia as an example. Uh, uh, that was that was the purpose of setting up that that that, that uh, facility. And from what I heard from colleagues 
right on the ground. Up to today, that facility has not been able to generate any energy, the energy demand for, for, for Ethiopians. Uh, the same goes for Lagos. It's, not, it's, it's a project that has been proposed, but our economies, our, 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 you know, our, we, we can clearly say that it's not possible for the energy need of Lagos to, to come from that, that waste stream. And because it doesn't work anywhere, there are many other options that have been proposed to, to boost the energy need for Lagos. Um, I, we think that the Lagos State Government should um, embrace that and rather look at, look at uh, uh, energy from incinerators. So we are so convinced that, yes, that facility will not give the Lagos State the, the energy uh, it needs to, to power the police, definitely. Mm. Thank you, Leslie. And even if it would, it would be very, very little fraction. And myself, I visited uh, the, yes. the waste incinerator in uh, Ethiopia three weeks ago. And as a matter of fact, uh, this incinerator is in the hands of the electricity authority of Addis Ababa, but they don't want to deal with it anymore because they see that it does not generate electricity. So they say it is a waste facility. So they want the waste authorities to deal with it. So it is a clear example that yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah. The this, case of Lagos uh, is also a kind work. of secrecy. If you really think he's going to give us the energy cap capacity, share the information. Let's take orders. Let us even see the energy mix and what what uh, what quantum is going to uh, is going to generate. Let's even look at the technology. We don't even even though we don't believe in any any sustainable uh, incinerators and technology, but what is even the technology? So the fact that we don't have, do not even have the information. Then of course uh, it shows that uh, it, it cannot be sustainable. It's, everything is happening in secrecy and for economic reasons. Thank you, Poeta. Thank you, thank you. There is a question and um, some comments about nappies. Um, <laughs> I think in your uh, presentation, Yannick, are you here still? You showed that nappies, uh, yeah, actually are in a in a well performing separate collection scheme like in Italy. Hmm. You have nappies which actually sum up to a lar large percentage. Myself, I also know it from my own experience. They are there. Are, there is a lot of them, but I also use the reusable nappies on weekends, at least, and that really say helps me also to reduce the amount. So, what would you say about nappies? And what is it a reason? Is our nappies single use nappies a reason to build an incinerator? <laughs> well, <laughs> absolutely, it's not. It's it's true that nappies are one of these items that kind of tend to. Uh, uh, stay in a, in a very re uh, kind of residual waste, you know, the kind of waste which normally you cannot recycle, uh, but you would not build a facility for that. What you should, do be, what you should be doing is actually to, to kind of um, uh, move, in, move into a, a reusable uh, and recyclable nappies. Uh, actually, there are quite a lot of number of schemes, uh, um, at least here in Europe, uh, to, to recycle and reuse them. Uh, and that really helps to uh, to address this. It's nappies is often is the kind of problematic item where you you know you want to reduce uh, uh, if you want to reduce the kind of residual waste you have to deal with the nappies. So you have to get it into either recycling or reuse. And that's the only way um, I would say. Thanks. There are but, some case studies for that too. Oh I yeah. Know, by no. Europe. So, Marielle, so they were very I, inspiring for me too. And yeah, Maria wanted okay. to add, maybe if you, I, if you I allow. hear the, yes, I, I just want to echo what Andy Riz was saying about nappy libraries in Wales, and definitely we have some of these in England as well. Um, and I think nappies to me uh, is is this very problematic item that um, that really pushes us to understand waste management as a very comprehensive strategy where we need to have waste prevention and redesign of many products that will need to be rethinked um, and where disposable nappies may still have a place. I don't know. I think we should definitely invest in reuse at scale and redesign of nappies. And this will go along with all the other uh, waste management strategies of composting and separate collection and recycling and so on. But to me, it's interesting to see that it has to be a comprehensive strategy. It cannot be just like, okay, we're just going to get the waste and we're going to burn it because this is where we definitely waste resources and waste money and, and public health. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's uh, that's in the in the north, yeah, the libraries of nappies. I know uh, they are quite uh, available, but how about the south, global south? Do anyone... Does anyone know about such um, uh, existing 
uh, even absorbent hygiene products. So, so women hygiene also. So I know if you know, you can paste some links here, uh, or um, or we can go also to other topics then. Um, um, other questions. Okay, that's a bit tricky. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, uh, there is one question here. Can a speaker shed light on whether waste incineration for non-recyclable fractions works better in public hands or private? In none. <laughs> um, maybe a bit more explanation of this question. The whole idea is to avoid it. Um, but if it's held in, in public hands, we can see the example of Flanders in Belgium, where there are public policies to reduce them uh, slowly. You know, politicians here where I live, they do, they did realize this is not the way forward. So they have a strategy in place to reduce, to reduce, uh, you know, the capacity of them in, uh, as, as we go. That's for countries who already have a lot of waste installation. Denmark is go doing the same. I, yeah, Mar Mariel Orlianek, please confirm. Uh, but unfortunately, there are uh, many still that uh, uh, try to absorb this uh, need for uh, new investments by the waste in installation industry. Yannick? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's indeed a, a something that comes up quite a bit. Uh, I would say um, uh, it's better in the public hands because then you can, uh, you know, take a decision and, and move away from it uh, while the private, um, I would say, would be quite challenging uh, to voluntarily to move away from it. Even though this is what they are planning to do in Denmark, they want to... Uh, um, privatize the incinerators because they're mostly, uh, I think, uh, hold, held by, um, owned by, uh, by, by the municipalities. Um, but uh, I, 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 what I see is that, you know, you can be more ambitious when you are municipality and uh, you, you do more things. You can, for example, conduct a study or, to, yeah, you are more kind of proactive. Um, not always, I would say, but uh, in general, I, I would be in favor of um, it being publicly kind of uh, owned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One question, as you have the mic, there was a question about MRBT, mm. so biostabilization. Uh, the aim is to do something kind of composting, but mm -hmm. then when you put it back on the landfill, it get, it rains again, so it gets wet again. So would yeah. you have leakage, but how is it the problem? No, I mean, uh, so when you when you when you have this uh, uh, aerobic or anaerobic treatment, actually, you also you degrade the kind of uh, organic structure. So it's uh, it's even if it gets some wet, it does not produce that much methane. Um, okay. And and uh, um, also well, um, for the landfills in general, what we recommend is that you put an active layer on top of it. So even if you produce some methane. This active layer will capture um, capture it and and it therefore reduce the impact. So it, it's mm -hmm. it's not uh, such a problem. Huh? Mm -hmm. As I hear, I hear that sanitized landfills, so engineered landfills, probably have a role to play in the transition that is flexible because they are not as they don't have the lock-in effect. They are there; yeah. they can accept waste, but they don't have to. While incinerator has to be burned at a capacity day and night. So, um, because if you don't burn it uh, equally, then you have all those problems with temperature that Mario explained. Yeah, that, and that's when the dioxins are formed because sometimes you have higher temperature, sometimes lower. So, um, yeah, I see this. So we could uh, make a kind of conclusion that indeed maybe let's rethink the waste hierarchy while yeah, MRBT with uh, engineered landfills actually have a more role to play climate wise also uh, unlocking some financial streams to better solutions rather than to lock them into the incineration. Uh, is that a question for me? Yeah. Uh, no, or Mariel. So yeah. Perhaps. Well, I mean, uh, for, for, um, you know, as I said, like this is this is actually our strategy, and it's really built on uh, on the resources uh, um, experiences, like the people who have been working uh, on waste management for for decades. So this is what we believe we should be doing. Uh, um, mm -hmm. 
Um, of course, the focus has to be uh, on, on, on minimizing the waste generation in the first place, but this is what you do um, with the residuals that you still generate during that period. So, okay. and it's really a flexible system and, and, and it's less polluting as you, as you saw, and it's cheaper. And, and there's actually so many reasons why, uh, why it's so much better than uh, um, uh, burning, burning your stuff. Okay. Thanks. I will ask Mario also for the last word. But before that, for the last word of the whole webinar, I wanted to ask Brex if, uh, because I cut you short during your presentation, your uh, input, if you wanted to share what you've heard very shortly uh, or add uh, on top from Philippines. Hello. Oh. I, I call you like this. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, sorry, there's uh, something with the video. But um, uh, uh, maybe just to add very quickly some a little bit about the about banks and international financial institutions. There was mention earlier about uh, about most of the finance. I think it was climate finance towards waste going to waste incinerators. I think it was something like ninety percent, if if my memory serves me correctly. Um, just to mention also that there are there have been several uh uh lobbies recently by CSOs with uh, my, my, my organization Gaia towards uh, really trying to um, increase safeguards um, uh, towards the use of these incinerators. And this is really through uh, the regulation or the banning of dioxins, furons, and many other hazardous chemicals that incinerators are known to put out and emit. Um, now, uh, there have been some victories in AIB, Asia Infrastructure Bank, that's uh, located in China, for example, there is this ban on dioxins and furans. And we have also seen that recently in the recent update of the ADB, Asian Development Bank, uh, that's located here in the Philippines. Um, however, uh, this is still not a, uh, we we're seeing this as not a solution yet, because even though there is that ban, um, companies and the banks are still able to put out and invest in uh, a lot of these incinerators. Um, so the, the fight continues and we will continue to monitor these, uh, these projects. Um, part of that also is monitoring the different companies that are investing in these, several of whom um, actually are, you know, they're, they're suffering from financial losses or they have uh, uh, fraudulent cases in court or other practices that, that that really from the beginning should not be should not make them viable for for a partnership with any sort of financial institution. Thanks. Thank you very much for for this um, layover to financing Mariel and maybe any other closing remarks. Yes, and I want to add that um, echoing a question that was in the chat that I thought was interesting. I was asking, uh, do we have a strong business models for these zero waste alternatives? Do we have something that we can really um, offer to push aside this, the, the business model of incinerators? And I think the experiences that we see on the ground definitely do. And the Dar es Salaam, Durban, Accra, San Fernando, so many places, especially in the global south that, and, and and in Europe as well, but definitely the global south, a lot of the zero waste experiences that are demonstrating its feasibility, its accessibility, the benefits for jobs and all the rest of it. That said, the business model is there. And that said, I have to say that if we are just thinking in terms of profitability, if we are thinking that waste management is going to turn into a bankable project, as we often hear financial institutions talk about it, we may have to think twice because we need to see waste management as a public sector and definitely a responsibility from a public government in the first place. And we need to aim to make it financially sustainable and definitely there's an economic aspect that we need to make sure that it works and that it's sound. But waste is not going to turn into this money-making machine that's going to make this profit, that's going to be definitely competitive with another economic sector on, on, and, and in the market. So this is why it's important to look at the savings precisely and the cost of inaction. The savings precisely in Durban, uh, the grant work organization that has been implementing a zero waste project to have done the cost savings analysis, and it shows the money that they've saved through the zero waste projects, the money that it would have costed to landfill all the waste. And I want to add this cost of inaction the cost of inaction mm -hmm. of doing nothing with waste. It's an economic 
um, we can monetize it. It's not monetized because, of course, pollution is not always monetized. But if we boot and we boot monetize it to the future, the cost of inaction would definitely be um, unaffordable, not something that we want in a sustainable planet. Thank you very much, Maria. So this was a wrap up. Uh, and thank you, everyone. I think the, the recording will be shared online. Please continue on LinkedIn. Uh, to share the good examples. I know many of you here and many of you stayed until very late. Uh, I mean, uh, 90 minutes webinar, so thank you for that. I know you want to engage, you want to share your links. Please do share uh, under the post that uh, will share the recording of this webinar. So thank you again. Thank you to the speakers uh, from all over the world. And thank you to BOS Wise for hosting. Uh, Akangska, over to you. Thank you, Piotr, and thank you so much to the panel today for sharing uh, their insights and knowledge and uh, experience. Um, we saw so many attendees engaging in a conversation in the chat section. There were a lot of comments and um, the, the section was flooded with a lot of comments and views and links. Um, and we were glad that you all took active part in this discussion. The idea was to have a discussion, a constructive discussion, so that you all can share your insight and network and connect to make such dialogues more uh, fruitful and constructive. So thank you again for all the attendees for joining in and uh, you know staying till, uh, as Patrick mentioned, for 90 minutes. Thank you so much. As we mentioned, this, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our uh, YouTube channel and on our website. If you'd like to stay updated, we've already shared the links uh, of the social media handles and also our newsletter. Uh, we also mentioned uh, the links of uh, the LinkedIn profiles of all the panelists. There are many unanswered queries as well, and we would ensure that these are being passed on to the panel. And uh, hopefully, uh, we will get response. You will all get responses on their email ID. Once again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, good day to all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.